Greetings, ladies and mentalgents, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Outer Tales, Space, from out, from out, from out. where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would just like to thank the following tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Fallen Angel, Buzz Kennington, Data Magnet, and Bob the Dragon. Thank you again, and now on to the story. Story number 1. Size Matters, written by Tellerus. Dr. Susan Wesley, Royal Fellow of the Museum of Extraterrestrial History, brought down the vertigo and rush of air as the Ool Charm turned and carried her atop his right hand to his favorite arm stool, his six powerful legs easily carrying him through the cavernous interior of his house. Great rooted arches supported the ceiling of each room, all of them decorated with beautiful, delicately painted flowering plants that reminded Susan of roses more than anything else. The walls were covered from floor to ceiling in titanic shelves, all of them holding a variety of books and scrolls. Here and there a picture frame or monitor broke up the shelving, but all the same, it was very clearly a room belonging to some serious academic bent. Ulchan's hand came to rest beside the thick leather armrest. Thick enough for Susan, it seemed more like a solid ground than leather. And she jumped over to it, enjoying the sensation of low gravity as she did so. It's good to finally meet you. It is good to see you in the flesh, agreed Ulchan, as he settled his six legs and tail over his armstall and settled down. Susan threw out an arm to balance herself as the armrest moved under its owner's weight. The transition equipment Susan wore rendered the alien's speech into an unaccented male voice, but she could feel rather than hear the real speech as it vibrated through her. Where would you like to begin? Well, with the war, I suppose. Why? Why it happened? Why the Galactic Federation attacked? Why we won, even? Ulchan turned to look at his tiny guest, his long, sauropod-like neck twisting around to bring all six sets of eyes closer to Susan. What do you know of my people's history, Doctor? Not a lot, I imagine. He withdrew his head and clasped two exceedingly human hands together. We founded the Galactic Federation, you understand. A hundred, no, ninety-five thousand years ago. We would have conquered our neighbors instead, but that was impractical, you see. Better to rule them indirectly than to try and fight in an interstellar war. But that makes no sense. We humans fight all the time. We've never been uh, united, not even during the war. Old John smiled. At least Susan thought that it was a smile. And how many humans are there? I ask. Because at the peak of the Galactic Federation, just prior to the war, there were about a billion of my people. A little over, in fact. I remember the celebrations fondly. He gave another smile at Susan's shock. Low gravity worlds allow life to grow far in excess of what your giant of a planet could support and land. But of course, we need more resources each. And a smaller planet means less space for each individual. True, we could get it into space far more easily. Is it true that the first humans had to use chemical rockets to get into space? Um, yes. Neil, no, um, he was the first man on the moon. Uh, Yuri Gagarin, he was the first man to go into space. A brave person. We were able to build a series of space elevators instead. Far safer and more efficient. Took us a long time to get that far, admitted Susan. But that doesn't explain why you didn't fight more. Given roughly equal numbers, you could have. Well, we did sometimes, admitted Ulchan. But it was hard to do so. Tell me, how many of your warrior cars put into one of your battleships? Warrior cl Oh, you mean, uh... 
We have two sexes. Ah, oh, my apologies. I keep forgetting such a strange concept. I fear I'm too old to understand it. The entire arm still rocked as Ul Chan gave his version of a shrug. Anyway, you didn't answer my question. Oh, maybe a hundred and fifty? I don't really know much about that kind of thing, Susan admitted. A hundred and fifty, Ul Chan said in wonder. A hundred and fifty. Can you imagine, or perhaps you've seen, how big a starship would be to fit a hundred and fifty of my kind aboard it? But that would mean you could mount far large machinery too. Shield generators, engines, everything. I know that much about the principles of starship design. True, true. But what about mass and inertia? Tensile strength, sheer stresses, the cube root law. A, uh, I suppose you would say a cousin of mine, a very good engineer. He was part of a team tasked with designing battleships for our space force. They did, after a fashion, but they were never built. Too slow, too unwieldy, and too fragile. He laughed bitterly, a booming, rumbling sound. After the war, I bought copies of your news reports and had them translated. What you called the Corvettes, we called one-person fighters. No wonder how carrier groups did so much damage. Had you ever faced anything as small and as dangerous as a human fighter? No. Oh, we had craft that small. Drones, mostly. But we both know the limits of the so-called artificial intelligence. But even our fighters, you cannot imagine how much more smoothly your warships could fight as a group. One of my people led a fighter, one mind set against the minds of dozens of humans. True, I can concentrate on any three things as well as you can on just one. But still, it was no contest. You can also see the difficulty in fighting even other species our own size. But... Why fight? Because it was now or never. My people are, person for person, more inventive than you humans. But when we are outnumbered ten to one, the advantage passes to you. What happens when we are outnumbered a thousand to one? The Federation has always thought along such term lines. We thought you were trying to conquer us, maybe even wipe us out. We would have, Old John admitted. Certainly conquest was our goal. Oh, we never admitted it until the surrender. Extermination. We began to consider it a year or two into the war. But outside of depopulating a few colonies from orbit, we were never able to pursue it seriously. The plague bombs. A lot of people won't ever forgive the Federation for that. City of them... One weapon is much like another in the final analysis. But do you understand now why we went to war? I think so, Susan admitted. Your people, the entire Federation, would have been swamped, lost amidst a galaxy of humans. She looked up somberly at the big alien. I'll do what I can. Ah! Ulchan laughed. Even if you return home, persuade your king to extend us protection... How long will that last? The Federation systems are rich in minerals. Will your king keep his own people from profiting from them? If he loses a war against other humans, what if someone else moves in? What about when my people rise up in rebellion? We too can lie, Doctor. We too can forget. Can let our passions overwhelm our reason. No, it is over now. We gambled and lost, and the galaxy belongs to the, uh, to the lesser races now. <laughs> I hope the translator got that right. I laughed all day when I first came across it. I'm still going to try, Susan insisted. God knows there's room enough for all of us in this galaxy. For the sake of my whole species, I wish you success. I'll even pray that your god of yours, uh, whichever one it is that you follow. He paused for a moment, confused or unsure. 
So many of them, he murmured. So very many of them. End of story. Story number two, or more accurately, an interactive question posed by Starcaller25. What if we are not the crazy assholes of the galaxy? We live on what many aliens may consider an uninhabitable death world. Sure, that gives us many advantages, but what about the simple common sense? Even amongst humans, it's rarely so common, but a great deal of it comes from knowing about all of the horrible, nightmarish crap that is out there and could happen if you eat that unknown, brightly colored space beetle. Aliens don't have that. They usually didn't evolve, in HFY universes anyway, on worlds filled with poison, venom, predators, widely unpredictable and violent weather, teutonic activity, large and small-scale war, crime, disease, solar radiation, even herbivores that can and will happily destroy you easily. So even the most dogshit stupid human would likely have common sense on a scale unheard of by aliens. We all know that when the skies go dark and you hear rumbling in the distance, it is best to head inside and get off the water. We all know that in the fathomless abyssal depths of the oceans, horrors await that will either devour you or make you wish they had. We all know that leaving food out too long causes it to rot. I feel like in these situations, humans would be safety officers, the security officers, and the ones making sure that naive aliens don't try and pet monstrous horrors found on otherwise dead worlds, or try to eat pretty bugs and plants because on their world, bright colors are everywhere, and the brighter the color, the sweeter the food, etc. TLDR we're the only things in the galaxy with common sense and a seemingly a self-preservation instinct surrounded by naive, seemingly suicidally dumb aliens while we desperately try to keep them alive for the duration of the mission. Drop your thoughts on this thought experiment slash question in the comments down below. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.